The first big talent partnership that we evolved over time was Zakes Bantini. The problem with South Africans is that we feel grateful to be at the table in LA. And he says we must change that mindset. Multi-award winning co-CEO at Grid Worldwide, CEO at 608, and worked with major brands, MTN, Inverashay, FND. Growing up in PE, I broke my back so it was like six, seven months trying to reconfigure and walk again. That figuring out is never going to end. When it ends, it means you're no longer restless. We ran out of money. We could buy one cup of coffee. So it was a half a cup in the morning and the other half at lunchtime. We've got to bring that passion back into it as an industry. We've got to evolve. And I think that's where technology has had a huge impact on the industry. I went to a Kevin Costner after party and I walked on the runway at Britney Spears. As a business, we can change the course of South Africa and Africa. And that's what we believe in. 608 allows brands and enable brands to play in culture. It's the wild. Wild, wild West. You gotta look over your shoulder and you better know exactly what saloon is in front of you. Anyone who's in the marketing space, this one's gonna be for you. Hey, welcome to the latest episode of the Seacast. It's an absolute pleasure having you here today. Before we get into the next guest, I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of what this podcast is about. We are about connecting creativity and technology to uplift the African continent and connect the world to Africa. What we do is we chat to members of our communities. We give them a platform to share their story and to share how they are connecting Africa to the digital economy and the world to Africa. So before we get into this next guest, if you like our content, I just want to remind you to like, share, subscribe and leave a comment down below about what you think about the conversation if you want to get more involved in the community you can also join the whatsapp group by scanning the qr code in this group we'll be able to share opportunities knowledge with you and you'll be able to meet other like-minded people of the community so yeah we hope to see you in the group soon until then let's get into the episode and we've got Uncle Adam in the building. Oh, Adam, <laughs> gotta get used to that. <laughs> Yo, yeah, no, I, I also need to get used to the whole uncle terminology because a lot of people come up to me and they call me the uncle in the furniture business. Um, um, going back to the Joshua Door days. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to some good advertising. Eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, you're not, you're also not a stranger to the uncle terminology, just as I am. But it's great to have you here, Thank Adam. You. Um, so yeah, multi-award winning CEO, co-CEO yes. at Grid Worldwide, CEO at 608, which we're going to find out more about. I'm really keen to find out more about that and worked with major brands, MTN, Inverashay, FNB. Yeah, a lot of skin in the game. So I'm really excited for this episode. Anyone who's in the marketing space, this one's going to be for you. And today we're really going to be talking about, you know, fusing culture and authenticity into projects to create meaningful experiences. Cause I know. That's what you're all about. So we were chatting on the phone yesterday. We had a really great phone call and I was really surprised because you gave me a little glimpse into your beginnings when it comes to operating in the marketing space. And you mentioned that you're in the modeling, you were in the modeling yeah, space at one point. I started there. And I was just like, my mind just blew because Pearl and I did an episode recently that you can go and check it out if you want. Um, where we spoke a little bit about my story and a lot of the beginnings that I came from was also in the modeling space and yeah. fashion industry. Like yeah. Yeah. it all started with um, sneaking into SA Fashion Week into the galleries. And then that's how I managed to like network my way into working with some PR agents and Mini Cooper. And, you know, there was all these different projects that we touched on, but I thought that was so interesting. So generally on this podcast, we start all the way from the beginning so i wanted to find out adam could you tell us more about your Listen, my 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 beginnings a long time here it's uh, it's over 25 years ago um so thank you for having me on the show i'm really excited I, i've been following the show for a long time so it's just really cool to be sitting here and just you know hope everyone derives some benefits um so the modeling story it's just it's it's 10 chapters before where we are today um it it it's just a cool cool thing to do like uh, there was a big IT boom at the time everyone studied IT you had to do cobalt or some of these weird um IT programs or, or courses and that and I, I was just not an academic you know I, I grew up in PE so it was all about surfing and it was all about life saving um came from an avid sporting family and um tried studying man I just failed so badly and I, I just I couldn't understand the concept of studying and just you know going to class every day and the routine of it so when the waves are good, that was priority. That was a study time. Um, and, you know, it was just a good outdoor lifestyle, so which meant that you were naturally fit, you were naturally had a good physique. And then um, 
I'll never forget. It was a it was a school beauty pageant, and um, you know, he always gets someone in a town. And in this instance, his name was Heinz uh, from Port Elizabeth, and he he ran the local tuxedo and suit hire store. Uh, and he just saw something in me, and he kept pushing, and he's like, "Listen, you know, why don't you pursue the the modeling industry?" Um, and I'm not that tall, so the, the my height was a bit of an issue. You know, I think you've got to be one eight, and I'm one seven eight, one seven nine. But you can cheat that with a high pair of shoes. But yeah. uh, you're going to get caught out as soon as you hit the big time. So you, you know, it, it just it went on and on. Um, but I also had a few setbacks. So I don't believe my story is just a it's an easy one. I've had three major setbacks in my life. Um, you know, when I was 13, I broke my back in in a rugby game. I was quite small, so. Um, went down on the ball, loose scrum. Everybody got up. I was at the bottom, and this guy just decided he's going to jump cannonball, and he hit right into my back. Oh, Broke my back, so it was like six, seven months trying to reconfigure and walk again. Um, and then when I was 18, I had am ambitions of being a pro athlete. I came from a very athletic family. My brother was on a scholarship in the States. Came from a very, very athletic family. My mom had done comrades a few times. You know, Running was in our blood. And um, just before I had the possibility of maybe going overseas to start a pro career, um, they found a tumor in my palate. Uh, so that was, that was a year out, and, and it killed whatever ambition I had of being a pro athlete. And it was that time that I, uh, you know, it was the second big setback for me. Um, and I was like, you know, I was just too young to comprehend that it was never going to be, something was never going to be. So I pushed through, started gymming, started waiting. And um, a photographer picked me up in Cape Town and moved to Cape Town. He said, listen, have you ever modeled? And I said, yeah, I've dabbled in a little, but it was small time stuff. It wasn't long. Um, I was on a test shoot. And at the time, Elite had just come to South Africa. And we were called E-Mail, which stood for Elite Mail, mm -hmm. um, out of Cape Town. And uh, three months later, I was, I was in Barcelona. Um, I went on the circuit. I modeled Milan. I was in Athens, uh, London. And uh, let me tell you, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, breaking into into that scene is a big, big, it's a big task for anyone. And and I do believe, I do believe it can be enabled by people. Um, you know, you got to have something special. Like like in the modeling industry, the big thing there was the psychological, emotional drain that it that it has on 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 models. The best way to describe it is a brick wall. Um, and I'll give you an example, when you're in Athens or Barcelona in, in, um, or Milan during season, which is, which is our winter, um, you're getting 30, 40 castings a week mm. and you've just got to find your way around the city. You know what helps you? You've got to find your way. So it's a, it's an arduous task. It takes a lot out of you. So if you look at a brick wall, you go to 30 castings a week, take 30 bricks out because you've, you defeated, you, you didn't get the jobs you get. Mm. And if you, when you get a job, put five bricks back. But you're taking out more than you're putting back. Yeah. And, you know, you just got to continuously fight. And I, I did it for a good few years. It was three, four years. Um, it was a great life. I got to travel. I got to meet amazing people. Um, like some, some really cool, at the time, Leonardo DiCaprio, I think he had just finished um, Titanic. And, and he was with uh, an agency in Barcelona called Traffic. And I got to spend time with him. And oh, wow. I went to a Kevin Costner after party. And I walked on the runway with Britney Spears. And... You know, so it was when she was just really at the, at the peak of her career. So it just exposed me to a lot, and, I, and, I, and I'm always thankful for that. But I do believe it molded me into a, into a lot more emotionally tough human being. Mm. Um, and then when the, career, the modeling career, two, three years of really tough, tough times, started to just break into it, um, destiny kicked in again. And um, growing up in PE, I... Uh, I used to go lifesave with my mates along the garden route, PE, um, St. Francis, J Bay, Plet, up to Wilderness. And um, at the time, I was, I was following the summer seasons. When you model, you follow the seasons, and yeah. you always come back to Cape Town for November, December. And this was April. It was just after the Cape Town season. Went with my mates to go and model, um, to go lifesave. And it was, man, it was like 10 days over Easter weekend and at the time it was like 1500 rand but they put you up in a house gave you a car okay paid for everything and the 1500 bucks was just your pocket money and i didn't you know at the time i was making okay money modeling but the 1500 rand wasn't everything it was just time with the mates mm -hmm. and then on the last night um at the time there was a famous club called the cave the top of plet 
we used to have the plat rages there and uh coming home one night very early in the morning and um the door passenger door i was i was sitting in the car the passenger door just broke open oh, so i don't know if you know plat you go past cornetis go down and be canal that okay turn, and the door broke what are the chances and it just rolled out the car and that was the end of that morning done it was it was such a and uh, never forget there was an ambulance uh, at the time there was only an ad uh, one one hospital that happened to be a private clinic just open in Isa and one ambulance that does the garden route they were driving past okay so they got to me quite quickly um you know spent a good few weeks in hospital never broke a bone but it was like a cook sister I was just okay. tangled um and it was just such a reality check just going from such a high and seeing yourself on the cover of magazines and doing shows to just being as humble as asking someone to get your water, you know? Yeah. It was a really big thing for me and for my family. It was a super humbling experience. But, I, but you know, I also realized, I also realized like three things like that happened to you. It's destiny and you can control your destiny as much as you can, but when it's going to change, the course of life is going to change. Well, that that's what I wanted to get into, right? Because you mentioned when you were doing the modeling back in the day, um, I was actually going to ask you what led to the end of that because one thing that you highlighted was how you put you use this analogy with the bricks. It takes out thirty bricks, but then when you land something, you put five back. Yeah. But what I'm getting from that is it's depreciating, right? So it's at some point, depreciating. Oh, yeah, you know, and that, and that's the and, and that's emotional depreciation. That's mm -hmm. mental depreciation. So, you you know that's you, you, when you try and make it in like what I always deem the creative industry, which is the fashion industry, the mm. the art industry, uh, the music industry, you know, it's, it's just a tough world to break into. Um, and, and, you know, I also realized it wasn't necessarily this whole facade about being beautiful and, um, you know, you've got to have perfect looks and a perfect physique. Like that's not true. It's, there's a quirkiness to the, mm -hmm. the the fashion industry goes after, and if you mm -hmm. either got that quirkiness, yeah, there are the the, the brands that'll go for you know have a crumbie, they go for the good all American mm -hmm. look, but um, you know now today I still look at people. Um, subsequent to that, I got back uh, I got back in South Africa again, went home, had lost everything. Um, there was an issue at the time with my parents' medical aid, um, and you know it was it was an expensive deal, and took me two three years to recover. I hit a large period of that time was I hit depression um you know you go from being on top of the world to being nothing and I had to work through that myself I had a very supportive family but there was nothing they could do for me except mm. be there for me um and it was 18 months of just working like what is it you really want to do with your life and that was where the idea of brands came into my world because when you're modeling you are the brand you're the CEO you're the CFO you're the personal trainer you You've got to look after yourself and you've got to be that. So I think those that crack any industry are the ones that break through with determination and discipline and routine. Mm. You know, at a young age, routine is something that you don't like. You you break that mold of routine. But, you know, and it was those three things that really got me through 18 months of depression before I could surface and face the world again and say, okay, now what do I do with what at the time was not academic skill it was just life skills i'd been on the road six seven years i'd met amazing people and i traveled a lot and then i i harnessed that life experience as my university I, at, by that time i'd said well i've got a master's in life six seven years of doing it the goods and the bads i remembered one point in barcelona a good mate of mine i met him modeling um also south african we ran out of money so we only had enough we could buy one cup of coffee mm. so it was a half the cup in the morning and the other half at lunchtime Jeez. in the streets of Barcelona. We had an apartment, we had a roof over our head, but it got to that, that, you know, you get that close to the bottom. And I've always said today, you only know how high high is when you know how bot, how low the lows are. Yeah. hundred percent. And yeah. I think you very, you talk about entrepreneurship a lot. And for me, it's like a roller coaster. It goes up and it goes down, uh, which is what makes, I think in a sense, it kind of excites me in a way because there's no such thing as good without the bad, right? If we just had everything good, what would that mean? It would be pointless. There wouldn't be any meaning behind it, right? You know, I think if you, if in entrepreneurship or in anything, if you if you want to be a CEO or you want to be you know, in corporate, I think people, and I think social media has even amplified it even more now. Um, you know, they 
you, you will see the you can show the world what you want the world to see mm -hmm. and it looks amazing it looks glamorous but as I always say to people you know no one goes to bed at night with your thoughts and the struggles that you go through in your head and um, and that never changes it doesn't the older you get that doesn't change even when you get married you know so but I think you learn to deal with it a lot better you know you're not as emotional you're a lot more calmer and I just wish at 47 I knew how to if I had the level of confidence I did at 47 when I was 25, 22, trying to model, I'd be a great model. But that comes with time. That just comes with, again, maturity. So, you know, like, so so that was where this whole thing shifted into the brand world. And I was a brand and I am a brand. Um, and I loved brands. I saw brands. I worked on brands, you know, when I was modeling. And and from there, it was just that that was that became my world. Yeah. The world of brands and people in entertainment and in business. I want us to explore a little bit more about that transition from being in front of the camera to now moving a little bit behind the camera, because that's kind of the sense that I'm getting here. Yeah, and I, you know, being in front of the camera, like when someone says, okay, like, um, you know, camera lights action, and you've got to play out the scene in a TVC, it's it's difficult. Like, yeah. You're like, you watch, I have a huge amount of respect for actors. Mm. You know, it's not easy, like for those emotions and that. So, and I was really shit at that. You know, I just, I wasn't great at acting. Um, but now, you know, like where I am today, I get to be behind the camera in my own right. Um, and I always said, if I was in a position one day of leadership, I would give back as much as I can. I would give as much advice because I don't think there's enough advice around the realities of what it means to be young and growing into your career. Um, and, you know, so, so the opportunity to, to tell people is a big thing for me. It's a real big purpose and something I... You know, I really, um, I really take to heart and, you know, I'm just super fortunate. You, you know, I've, I've been part of a, building a very successful business, but it also comes with its struggles. You know, it's also a business that has been through ups and downs, but the thing that kept us consistently successful was we had developed this philosophy, which was make it mean something and make it mean something was, was, was developed by the founder, Nathan Reddy, you know, he's an incredible human being. Um, he, he just has, he'll give you the shirt on his back. He's, he's a very giving person, but he's also unforgiving when it comes to the requirements of what it means to be a creative and, and the power of creativity. So it was about eight years ago when he came up with this idea of make it mean something. And again, it's taken us eight or nine years to build real meaning in make it mean something. So the philosophy stand, you, you know, you can, anyone can come and say, Anyone can design a logo, but no one can give a brand meaning. Mm -hmm. And it's the meaning, which is the expression and the feeling the brand leaves you with, that is the meaning. So when we get how many requests, hey guys, can you do us? It's always a logo and a website. And we're like, no, I, I'll give you exactly who can do that for you. But if you come to me and say, listen, we want to change the culture of an organization, of a big blue chip, and we want to move it from there to being customer centric like that's the real task oh and by the way this is what the identity would look like to re reflect that shift in the brand what i love about what you're saying is it's all purpose-led so yeah. when it comes to the website and the logo that's more of a tool to achieve a purpose it's a visual representation so when you look when you look at a brand you've, you if that brand doesn't evoke some sense of emotion you've just graphic designed it yeah then and, and that's what we really pride ourselves on for for with grid so if you ever look at never forget when when the marble brief came on you know we've all been to marble or enjoy marble and it was a blank piece of paper that said listen we want to see 250 people every night of the week and the food will be prepared on an open flame mm. and you know gary the owner and, and he said him and nate are very good friends and he's like what would that look like you know conceptually what is the what does this restaurant what is this what does this experience look like? And that's where Marble came, you know, and then that evolved into Saint, evolved into Zoo and then Pantry. And I think the beauty about creating a brand now that has, or a, or a group of hospitality brands that has, um, they've, you know, if Marble had to open a hotel, in your mind, you would know that hotel would be exclusive you know, to be curated, you know, to have a very strong design ethic. It would have the most beautiful art pieces. It would have an array of different food and, and, and cocktail offerings. It comes with a level of 
absolute curation and exclusivity. And that's how we've built the brand. So if they say, you know, pantry, which is a forecourt effectively by Marble Group, you just know there's an elevation mm. in forecourts. And, and, and for us, that's the, that's the real essence of, of, of building brand. I think, the, I think the thing that sits behind it, though, that is very critical, if you had to say to me, and, and, you, and I, I appreciate you pointing it out, co-CEO, there are two CEOs. There's myself and David Cohen, who's literally my partner in crime, and we're, we're total opposites in every way, physically, mentally, spiritually, um, and that's where the beauty lies. So we've been, geez, we've been co-CEOs for over eight, nine years, and we, I think we're almost one person. But, you know, if you go back to this idea of building brands with purpose, the most important thing for me is the talent that you get to believe in that philosophy. Yeah. Um, and, and we've built an organization of just over 100 incredible, talented, creative minds. And, um, you know, in that same thing, we built a, a center of excellence. We, we, we have high expectations of the staff. But also we, we did, we've never built a business where you work for us. We've built a business where you come to work to change the world in some way. And I've always said, I'd love to change the world one brand at a time. Mm, yeah, for sure. That thing of purpose and also the word that's coming to my mind as you're speaking is trust and feeling, right? Because feeling ultimately is what drives people to take action. Right. No one's going to make a choice based like there's actually psychological studies out there where people will look at if people understand the logic behind their choices versus the way they feel about something. And time and time again, people will make the choice based of how they feel. They'll go against the logic based on how they feel. And one thing that we spoke about on the call, actually, now that I recall it, excuse the pun, um, is how you mentioned that you base the decisions that you make off of how you feel about things, which is why you wanted us to chat before we do the yeah. podcast. Yeah. I think that's a prime example of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's why I think I, Paul had reached out to me and just gave me some good context, but I just, and then when I messaged you, you know, like with any, I believe with any, if anyone said, what do you guys actually do as an agency? We actually sell trust. You know, if you go back to, the, the Lee Clow and Steve Jobs relationship in the 80s, um, there's, a, there's a great piece of content where um, S Steve Jobs actually tells Lee Clow, like, what do you do for me? And it, and, and it was all centered around trust. So, you know, if you and I can, and that's why it's just a case of you and I having a phone call because you're going to pick up a rapport. You know, you can certain feelings and connections, you can't, they may build over time, but the spark mm -hmm. is, it's, it's an instant one where it's not there. And, I, and especially as something as intimate as a show like this, you know, you and the host better have some kind of connection. You better have some means in which you can laugh and, and you can enjoy the show. Um, and I think in building brands and building trust in clients is, is the exact same thing. So as a business and as a CEO, I have the best creative team, I believe, on the continent in my business, the best strategy team. And a lot of people say, like, like Ad, what is your role really? Um, there is the Adam test, which I'd mentioned to you on the phone. I'm not... And the Adam test is just before a pitch or there's a piece of creative work they want to take to a client. I'm as literal as a lot of clients. So I see it for what it is. Um, and I get it wrong. You know, even though I'm CEO, I get it wrong. And it's good to have that different mix in the business. And Nathan's really good. He knows how to leverage people's strengths and weaknesses. So at the end of the day, with our staff, we, we, we like to build a huge amount of trust and we trust in them and they've got to trust in us. And that that becomes a secret source for which you're going to build great brands and, and through the trust there's passion there's commitment there's resilience um and and you work as one you, you know like um you know garnering a hundred people behind a big a big piece of work is a big task and you know everyone's got something to deliver so you know wake up in the morning and and just like damn i actually want to be there this is what i love doing you know, and I think the creative industry, I think the the ad industry, I think it's in a state of flux, to be honest. I, I think we've got an issue with long-term talent wanting to be a part of the industry. It's not like it used to be. It's not that burning desire to be a copywriter, to be an art director, to be a filmmaker. And we've got to bring that, we've got to bring that passion back into it as an industry. And um, we've got to evolve. And I think that's where technology has had a huge impact on the industry. Some some creative minds are apprehensive of technology where we as a business, um, you know, we, a machine will never take away the originality of a human being creating an idea. 
Yeah. That will never be there. But what technology can do is amplify it mm. and scale it. Yeah, for sure. I, like coming back to that tool analogy, right? A website might be a tool to achieve a purpose behind a brand, but technology is a tool to achieve a purpose from a person. So it, it's like a hammer. If you have a hammer that's sitting in a toolbox, it's not going to just magically build a house, right? Yeah. Someone needs to wield that hammer. And that's why, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh no, it's going to replace me. Well, it's going to replace the non-creative things in my opinion. It's going to replace the thing where you take this and you put it there. There's no sense of creativity behind that. Where the creativity comes into it is when someone starts thinking, well, how am I going to move this thing from there? And you start ideating and that's, that's what I refer to as curiosity. I don't think technology can replace that curiosity. Yeah. And that's what I think drives the best talent in the space. Um, I'm going to, I would love for us to move to that technology conversation, but yeah. before we do that, I have to ask a bit of a selfish question. Yeah. So you mentioned that you've got the best team in Africa. Yeah. How does one go about building that? But not only that, what lessons, had, were there any lessons that you learned from your trials and tribulations that kind of helped you build that team? Yeah. I, I mean, you, you know, again, I think every CEO is going to claim they've got the best, but you know, we genuinely have great people. Um, the, the lesson for me is that as an agency, we've never, you know, that, that, that creative space is super competitive. Um, and for many years there was, you know, you go back to the old ad land days and I don't come from the industry. So I didn't build my, apply my trade as an ad guy. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur and I've tried different things. So when I hit the industry, I came in at quite a senior level in, in the client service. I was already probably like a, a, a group account director, um, which meant that I had missed probably 15 years getting to that point, but I had done everything else, other experiences. So, you know, for me, how we've built, how we've built the creative team that we are looking for, we also look for slightly off the beaten track. Um, we, we have a non-traditional interview process, it's, which I think is quite important, but our, you know, we haven't gone out and poached people from other agencies and other people have invested to get them where they are. Yeah. We've nurtured a lot of our talent. And for us, I do think that is a, that's a real, real important way of building a team. You know, we've watched a lot of youngsters um, grow from from being designers to becoming, you know, Nathan on two instances is at a very young age, given design, uh, design creatives actual shares in his business. The one is Paul Hinch, who's been number, SA's number one designer for many years now, and he's been in the business 20 years. Um, there's Janil Kandasami, who is the real young young gun at the moment um, at Grid. And, you know, he was a shareholder at 28. Mm. And it's a lot, it's a big responsibility, but now he's 35, 36. And I said, I can't believe you're that old already. You're getting old. So we've nurtured a lot of this talent. We've, and, and the reason why we nurture them is because Grid doesn't operate on a traditional agency operating model. Mm. You know, we've built our model and we've, when people look at us, when we look at our bottom, our operating model, um, we don't look within the industry to evolve it. We actually look more outside of the industry. So we look at F1 teams, we look at uh, tech businesses, you know, they, they've killed, they've killed the creative industry in terms of the culture they've created for Google's and the Apple's for their staff. What, what do you think about Red Bull? I'm a big fan of Red Bull. I, I think, can you just believe that an energy drink is the fastest car in the world? Yeah. It is killing everything and everyone out there. And at the moment, I don't think I'm a big F1 fan. I don't think anyone's going to come near. You can put, I'd be interested to see if, if you put Verstappen in another car. Mm. I think that would be the real acetate, but that will never happen. Um, and when that Red Bull scandal happened a few weeks ago, I thought that was either incredible sabotage to disrupt where Red Bull's going. I think they're going to dominate it for the next few years. But, you know, Verstappen, I'm not a big fan of his, but let me tell you, he has he has one thing in his mind and one thing only, and that is winning. Yeah. And I, you know what fascinated me last season? He's won it now three times in a row. He had four or five races to go. He had already run the, won the championship, but he was not giving up until the end of the season. And that takes a special human being to be that. And, and there's a lot that people can take from that. No one's going to give it to him. He now knows that it, in order to be the greatest, he's got to win that five more times. And I think he's going for it. He's made that up in his mind. And he will get drive over Hamilton and over anyone else like he did in Abu Dhabi that day. He didn't apologize for, for, the, for the car, the, you know, the, the lap car coming out. 
It is what it is. There, there's a certain sense of audacity yeah. that drives that per se. Yeah. And I think a lot of South Africans are missing that audacity. And I think it become it comes from we've constantly been beaten down as a nation over the last few years. And I think yeah. we kind of lack that. You, you know, it's it's an interesting point. So in the last two two years, part of we we opened this entertainment business called Six Oh Eight, and there's there's a story behind Six Oh Eight. And the first big talent partnership that we evolved over time was the was the Bantuni. Hey, hold on, hold on. I just need to remind you very quickly to like, share, and subscribe, and leave a comment down below about what you think about this episode. We need to be able to tell the algorithm on YouTube that we are creating content that is valuable. So please engage with this content, whether you're listening to it on YouTube or on Spotify, or whatever platform, please engage. It just helps us reach more people, brings more people into the community, which means more access to knowledge and opportunities for you, a member of the community. So please don't forget to engage on this video or this audio podcast and leave a like, comment or subscribe and give it a share. Thank you so much. We'll hop back into the episode. And um, quickly, that, that, that relationship evolved very quickly. We had built his, we saw the, we saw the potential in him as a performer and as a musician. And then we saw the potential, more importantly, of him being a global brand. And that was when we got involved working on building the Zakes Mantwini brand. And it wasn't a year before we were with him at the Grammys, winning that Grammys for South Africa. And I'll never forget, you know, when you meet Zakes, he's an incredibly forthright human being. He's a musician by heart. He's not a DJ, so he, he, he fundamentally understands music. But he said something to me when we were in LA, and he said, you know, Ad, um, problem with South Africans is that we feel grateful to be at the table in LA. And he says, we must change that mindset. We should sit at the table and saying, we're here because we are here and we deserve to be here. So don't talk down to me because you have a better currency in a bigger country. And, and I love the spirit of the African rise at the moment in the entertainment industry, especially in the music industry. You know, South Africa's won its third Grammy in a row, Black Coffee, Zakes, and Tyler. We've now got an African category. Um, you know, Zakes and Voter and Nomseba won global music um, um, a, a single last year. Uh, you've got Shimza traveling all over the world this timber. You've got, um, you know, you've got so much incredible talent. And I think the world, you've got Bernaboy, you've got Davido. You've, we need to now stand up as a continent and stand up for what we think we're worth. Uh -huh. And if we don't do that, we're going to always be seen as a third world continent and a third world country that needs everyone's help. And mine's like, fuck that. And you know, like I was born in Zimbabwe um, and, and I was forced to leave the country because of my dad's circumstance. He was the colonel in the Air Force when Mugabe took over and there were some issues there. And um, no, I'm not going to be chased out of the country again. I'm staying. I'm going to fight for it. And I think the, the thing that I'm super passionate about for my business and for, for Grid and 608, Grid can make a, a big change in the narrative of this country because we're in communications and we can help drive a positive narrative um, and, and build nation branding brands. And the second thing is 608 for me is, is this idea of garnering the momentum and trust of the creative community and then putting that with brands to amplify it. So at the end of the day, um, as a business, we can change the course of South Africa and Africa, and that's what we believe in. Like really, that's what we're passionate about. Yeah, and I think that's why when we had that phone call, we aligned so much, is because we share that purpose. You know, our vision and mission within JD Creations is to connect Africa to the digital economy and the world to Africa. And we see tech as a huge tool to make that happen. So, for example, with Tyler, as an example, we look at her come up, that was largely fueled by social media and online TikTok. engagement that's on TikTok. Insane. And that's that's a part of the tech space. So we want to explore tech and how do we use tech to achieve that goal of making Africa a global superpower because there we really have the potential to get there. And I think it's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take a lot of teamwork and working together. But if we can shift the culture from a culture of competition more to a culture of collaboration, it's definitely within our reach. And we're seeing sparks of it in the entertainment space. Um, I want to find out more about six, um, 608. 608. And I want yeah. to find out more about, so you mentioned you worked with Zakes 
um, and helped him build himself into a global brand. Yeah. What like what does that look like when we say work? What does that mean? You know, so so. 608 is an offering within Grid Worldwide. So if, if someone like the elevator pitch on Grid Worldwide is that we build brands by giving them meaning and purpose. That is what we do. If you then, but, but what we've also found is, and through that process, we were always exposed to a lot of talent when we were shooting work, uh, shooting Shimza for Ballantines, Black Coffee for um, I Hope Joanna. Um, you know, so we're always exposed to this amazing talent. And, um, you know, when... When COVID hit, you know, we didn't survive. We actually thrived. I mean, we, we lost 60, 70% of our, our clients in six weeks because we're a project-based business. So marketing was the first thing that clients switched off. But we didn't panic. You know, we had a prop, strong philosophy and positioning. Um, we had a very, very tight leadership team. And within 12 hours of preempting the 27th of March, we had agreed how we were going to approach whatever it is that was coming. And it was first and foremost protect our staff. Secondly, protect our clients in what way we can. And thirdly, how do we contain what we can contain and forget what we can't control? And that was the philosophy of a leadership team that went into COVID. And we, we got through it in a really incredible way and we got closer. Um, and 608 was actually born through that process where the thing in our industry is, is there is just, there's incremental linear growth. If you've got, you've got a design experience or design offering, add on a little bit of comms, get a copyright and art director, add on a bit of digital, get a social media manager, um, add experience, someone who can do activations. And effectively, you've got a through the line agency. That's just linear growth. It's, it's, the, it's a natural growth of any creative agency if you're going to look to become a through the line business. And we had done that, but for us, in order to get exponential growth, and there was the, the big, you know, technology had, had really entered the fray, we looked at vertical growth. And we looked at 50 different potential verticals. And the two verticals that really stood out for us that were going to give us this exponential growth, the first one was product solutions. So an example is one of the biggest thing, anx anxieties for most banks in South Africa is the idea of um, taking your your card, your, your bank card out of your pocket and putting in the ATM because you get scammed, you get dis distracted and, and you know, most people still transact with ATMs and that was really big FMB's move towards, um, uh, you know, uh, banking on the app and mobile banking. And so product solutions in that instance, we had looked and looked at hologram banks, which meant that you could use your phone and it would interact with a hologram ATM. And it's that kind of thing that, you know, in, in Africa, I believe, I don't believe we innovate to survive. I think we, we don't innovate. We innovate to thrive, but to also deal our circumstance mm -hmm. on this continent. And that's a big thing for me. And, and I love that. You know, you look at Rwanda and the zip lines and, you know, that kind of thing. We've got to find a means to get from there to there, to connect the dots. And innovation is driving that for us. And a bank like FNB has really embraced that. So look at Geo Payments. Look at eWallet. Ingenious eWallet, you know. Um, so again, if you, if you, for the vertical growth, one big offering was product solutions. And then the second one was entertainment. The entertainment industry alone is worth billions. Um, and the entertainment industry is storytelling. So there we, 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 we looked at the entertainment industry and said, how could we get involved? How could we as a brand agency tap into that market? So, but we also then found that brands weren't having as much fun as they used to have. Um, and when I talk fun, they weren't, they couldn't, it was like they weren't didn't know how to embrace culture. The feeling was missing. Yeah, the feeling, and that was the that was the, that's the customer's feeling of this brand gives me a tingle. So, Grid Worldwide builds brands and gives them meaning and purpose. Six oh eight allows brands and enable brands to play in culture. And when we talk about brand playing in culture, it's you know it's it's creating a cultural moment for a brand. And the thing with cultural moments is they are they're not like brand plans. You can't foresee them twelve months in advance. Mm. No one we all could have believed it, but no one could have believed the groundswell and the moment South Africa went through to win the World Cup again. We all hoped for it, but that was became a big cultural moment in terms of nation building, mm. unity, and and you know the brands. And if you can jump onto a cultural moment as a brand of what what. Um, a great strategist once framed it as it's a fireworks moment that you can't preempt. Yeah. And if a brand can play in culture, so Dove, Apple, Nike, those people resonate with those brands because they show up in culture. They show up in your life. 
and and they contribute to your life. I love what you you're speaking a message of hope here, and I love it because it's super inspiring to hear. You know, personally, when I look at the challenges and the trials that we face in South Africa, for me, that's an explanation as to why we have the Tylers and the black coffees, because we live, I always use this analogy, we live in this box, right? That's kind of our circumstance. And in order to be able to navigate that box and to survive, we have to be creative. You know, people in America, they have access to all these endless resources. Yeah. And the question has become, well, what do you do with those resources? Whereas with us, we have limited resources. So in order to get something that means something, that has purpose, that has impact, we have to be creative. And those limitations force us to be creative. And I think that's where we get our secret source from. When it comes to um, Zeke Spantwini and kind of getting him into the global stage, like when I think the music industry, I think of a lot of like this competition culture and kind of people taking advantage of each other. Is this something that's common in the entertainment industry? Um, look, it's a tough industry. I mean, I'm, you know, I come from more fashion there. I could speak credibly that, you know, that is just, is a lot that goes on before, you know, you can break it. And there's a lot of things you go through. And I, I don't think the music industry is any different. I just, you know, working with Zakes and, and his business partner, Sibu, they, they have an incredible partnership. They are incredibly ambitious. Sibu, you know, he really, the world is his playing field and, and impossible is nothing. And if you then take an amazing talent like Zakes, the thing I think that's always going to differentiate Zakes is that he is a muso by at, at his heart. You know, he didn't stumble upon Munich music. He was intentional about studying music and he did his time studying it. And then he understood how to make music. And then he can, and then he became a performer. So before Osama was, before Osama became a global summer um, hit, he had been on the scene for a long time. But like anything in life, you just need the one campaign, the one song, and then you elevate. And I think the hardest part for any any creative is when that elevation hits. Man, fuck you, better be ready because it's going to come fast and it's going to go away as fast. So now even. You know, with Zakes and his team, it's a constant working on the evolution of his music, of his performances, of, you know, he's, you see him behind the decks and then you've got in our overlay what his visual experience will look like, you know, so then it becomes a, a total holistic offering that, that you can give the world. So the entertainment, in the, the music industry, it is really tough, you know, to go to the Grammys and see the scale of music and the impact it was it's one of the most incredible things and I've done amazing things in my life, but to see the Grammys and, you know, walk that red carpet and the rock walks past you. And I mean, these are, these people have big presence. They have mm. big, big personas and big, um, but again, for me, that's what America can allow you. And it does give you that, but there's, there's something amazing about the African talent. Like Burner Boy is doing incredibly well. He, he's, he's a big performer. He can fill Wembley stadium with 80,000 people. Um, and, you know, our local talent, Tyler, I think is going to become a superstar. She's got a great team in, in, in the States that's building that brand. And it was amazing to see her come home and get the response she did. Her music is great. Um, but the thing is that, that she's just very authentically South mm -hmm. African. You know, when she stood up and she said, what the heck? Like, that was just so South African. That, that was, we all were proud of that moment. So, and I just hope she keeps that authenticity because it'll be a big differentiator in the market. So, go back to your question around Zex. You know, he's constantly got to work hard at evolving himself because, he, and you know, what's the next album? What's the next big track? I think what makes him incredibly, um, what will keep him moving forward is he has, like his make it mean something is collaboration. So he, he always collaborates with, with very, very well-known talent or up and coming talent. So, you know, on any given day, you'll see him in studio with Kayenda Soul and Sonal Musician and... Um, Sky Wonder and vocalists and he's constantly collaborating and he's got some really big collaborations with with international stars some are South Africans that have gone overseas and some are just big international you know American talent and European talent so I believe as long as he's not selfish in saying it's for me and I want to collaborate to continue making the next big hit I think his career would just continue growing but now we've now got to frame that story and frame that brand you know, and when you start building a brand, that means you can create other revenue streams. You can create other opportunities for people to connect with your brand, whether it's through merchandise, through documentaries, um, 
you know, through through other branded sponsorships and that kind of thing. It's a, it's a, a brand is a living organism. Yeah. So a talent is a living organism. You've got to constantly be working at it. A great, I don't know the story intimately, but think of a brand and a name like Trevor Noah. You know, he's in, he's incredibly um, academic. He reads a huge amount of information to be able to take on American politics and speak with credibility and have very, very powerful people get nervous of him. But he, he he's invested and he's investing the team around him. So whilst I don't think you should ever, I've got a big team around me. I think 99% of the people around me are better than me, but we've built looking for people that are better than us and they're going to outgrow us. But a great team around a visionary or a visionary team is unstoppable mm. in every way. Sure. Creator, community, culture, collaboration. I don't know if it's a coincidence <laughs> that we have all these C's. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that collaboration and, you know, you always speak on culture and this conversation really highlights the importance of culture and the power behind culture. And that's why we started this podcast in this community is really to shift the culture, to inspire people to be audacious and to highlight people that are maybe more behind the scenes because yeah. people might see the Tyler, the Zakes, but they don't know that there's an Adam who's very much integrated yeah. into that process. Yeah. And you wouldn't be there unless Zakes had that cult culture of collaboration. Yeah. So, so all of these things are so important to achieving that shared vision, right? Yeah. And we need to kind of shift the culture. So that's why these are I think I want to flip a question back to you. Oh, okay. I want to flip <laughs> a question back to you. You know, and it's it's the word culture is such a big word. Mm -hmm. You know, so and I think there's what I've learned over the years, you know, I'm 47 year old. I'm very clearly a white male. And there's a perception that, you know, you passed your culture time in your life. And Culture is not necessarily fashion, art, and wearing the latest uh, Travis Scott, you know, sneakers. And and culture is a thing for me, where where you are, you know how to tap into a community, and you know how to draw out of the community what that community can deliver. So I'd love to go back to you. You know, what what is your definition for the show and for yourself? of what you think culture is, because I think all four of us, even in the room, would have very four, very different definitions of it. It's like, no, I'm, I'm head of digital. She said, mm. what does that even mean? You know, so this definition of culture, everyone has a different, I'd love to get your view on that, but it's, it's not everything about fashion and coolness. Mm. It, it, you know, at the moment, I believe it's what, it's culture that holds South Africa together, mm. you know, and it's cultures, um, it's not the coolness. It's this idea that we can connect. Like, you know, I saw your show and I connected with I, sh I connected with one of your speakers. That was what attracted me to the. It's show. funny because Bubele, he's also a Grammy Award yes. winner. So yes. you know, he's speaking about Grammys. So yeah. there's a common thread throughout this all. Imagine if we all just came together in a room. Mm. The power of that moment in a room, which is what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, um, that becomes a, that becomes energy, and energy becomes electric, and electricity becomes a force. I just so about doing that. I talk about friction. Yeah. So in order for that friction to happen, we all need to be in a shared space. Yeah. And for when you get that friction, you start getting sparks here and there. And some of those sparks land on some tinder, which starts a fire. And that fire can grow into a, a huge bonfire, yeah. which can have a huge impact and yeah. warm a whole community, right? So, so yeah, coming back to your question about culture, ultimately, that's really what it is. I mean, this whole thing started off with that vision of connecting Africa to the digital economy and the world to Africa. And once you've got the vision, the next thing becomes, well, how do you do that, right? Once you've got the what, then you can determine the yeah. how. Yeah. And this, this project of the creator community is really that how. And I won't say that I've got all the answers at the moment. We're still figuring it out. I think the thing that's really important, and you touched on this in the beginning of the conversation, is that persistency, right? When And just continuing trying and failing and trying again. And through yeah. them that you refine. I think there are two things. So to maybe give you a sense of comfort, we're all just, we're also still figuring it out. And, mm. you know, we are, we, 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 so that figuring it out is never going to end. Is when it ends means you're no longer restless, means yeah. you're no longer curious, though, as you had mentioned earlier. Um, but, but, you know, <clears throat> back yourself and believe in yourself. Mm. And because 50 people are going to tell you it's never going to work and one, per, you know, the thing, in the, the thing that I've learned over the years, if I had to go look back on my career and it was, it's the most unconventional, it's not even a career, it's just a great journey of hardships 
and for 50 for 47 years i failed and i still think i failed to the point where where in society it was never going to be about a big house and a fancy car and you know all these different accolades it was just it, and there you could there you we've all failed but and i think we've failed ourselves in that but the the great thing for me is is it only it, it's only been three or four people that have actually enabled a moment in my life that meant a big door was open you don't need everyone to open a door for you you need in a in a career that now spans 20 to 27 27 years i just needed i've had three people that have just been there at that time and was a destiny no i'd worked hard to find that person in my life and and also it came with a lot of hard work when others were seeing it as a fun job i was taking it seriously because i i started a little late you know i'd model for long enough to say fuck now i have to go find money and you know and um so i took it more serious so back yourself believe in yourself and let me tell you you're gonna have 500 doors slammed closed before one door will open and if you believe in it and if you're gonna die for it then you're gonna have to take the 500 to a thousand doors but do not give up on it thank you for that thank you yeah no i appreciate you saying that because it does get tiresome when you try and try again you keep failing one thing that we've done within our organization is we've shifted our mindset when it comes to failure so instead of you know mulling over it and feeling down we celebrate failure because every failure that you come across you one step closer to the success so it's actually a reason to celebrate absolutely so so yeah we and you know i was at a google event not too long ago this last week they had like an ai workshop and i went there and i met a lot of creators and it was so great to meet people in person and genuine people because what I often find is when you go to these creator spaces and you have people that focus on culture. And when I say culture, I'm referring to like the sneakers and yeah. jackets and, you know, being cool and all of yeah. that. Like when they, when I tell them we do a podcast, they'll look and they'll see, oh no, you've only got like 300 subscribers. You're only getting like a hundred views and they don't really take you seriously. But we know like based off of our experience of what we've seen in other people's careers based on, I mean, you've just reaffirmed it now is you have that hockey stick effect. And I think with young people, a lot of people are striving and trying to capture that like viral moments, right? And they're not, they haven't done the work beforehand and you don't want that because if you do have that lightning strike and you haven't done the pre preparation to capture it in that glass bottle, you miss the moment, right? And it doesn't create sustainability. So we're happy with the fact that we have maybe a hundred views per episode or whatnot. We know that we're on a journey here and yeah. we, ha we are purpose driven. So it's not about virality. It's not about having the coolest sneakers. It's about achieving that purpose. And we may not be achieving it now. We may not have the right formula now, but what we know is that as long as we keep on trying but and every time fail. You know, the thing is, and I, and I appreciate that it's good and it's going to get harder for you guys. Um, but people are watching, including someone like myself, you know. So the thing, though, is that the problem with the youngsters, with the youth, is they're impatient. Yeah. They want, we they want to the big, they want, the, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you know, like my, my, I've got two toddlers. My, my little guy can't write, but he can, he can, he'll send me a message via Siri. Okay. Wow. So they use Siri. That, that, yeah, he'll send me, you know, my daughter. So if he wants to watch a program. He, he knows the visual of what um, Bluey looks like. But if he wants to watch Bluey season two, episode 47, he says, and they know how to communicate with technology. So they don't have to learn to write anymore, which is, which is a worry. And then the, sec the second thing though, is that, so in that impatience, you're right. Like, you, you know, you, you, I, I would, let, let me put it this way. When I was 24, cell phones came out, 24. Sure. You know, it's a long time ago. So my kids still, they saw a landline the other day. And they're like, Dad, how does this thing work? Do you speak through that wire into the wall and it's the person on the other side? So you're right. There's, a, there's, this, there's this idea of instant gratification. Now, let me tell you the hard truth about that. That is in a world when you need something. Instant gratification in your career and building a career is the total opposite. But give it's it. a slow burn. It's a hard burn. The flame is going to go out in some days. The flame is going to get water on it and it's going to be dead and you have to reignite it. It's not instant gratification. And I think the, you know, real knowledge, that's why you don't know it when you're young, but the older you get, you get this idea of OGs and, you know, speaking to older people, they have so much wisdom and all they, a lot of the time, the wisdom is around patience 
and listening. You have two ears and one mouth. You don't have two, you know, two mouths and one ear and a phone. Mm. Just listen around you. Take time to stop and smell the roses. It's a beautiful world. Um, I, I think, I think we're going through a transition as a country. We're going into elections. I don't know if it's calm before the storm, but it's the calmest it's ever been pre-elections. But I, and our country is not going to change overnight. You know, we built on a continent that that is very different to the rest of the world. And now we've got to learn to accept that and move forward. We're never going to change ourselves to being um, a continent like an America or something. This is what we are. This is who we are. And it's gritty. And you better be prepared to get your hands dirty to make it happen for yourself. Yeah, those are the ingredients. Yeah. Those are the ingredients. So, quick one. Yeah. Favorite book that has changed your perspective on business or creativity? Shit, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, my favorite book was actually neither of creativity or technology or anything. My favorite book was actually The Alchemist many, many years hello, ago. Hello. And I traveled with a book when I was go modeling and the book became a journal. I turned the book into a journal. Um and I would read it on every flight between countries. And every time I read it, because you have a different experience, something different in the book would resonate with you. So the book that has stuck with me for 20 years as a journal became is The Alchemist. Um, and, you know, and, and it's, I think it's 177 pages. Mm. It's an easy read, you know. And again, the, the misconception of a book that that's deep gives you that much knowledge you know, you read, I tell you a great story and I'll, I'll deliver it for you. I've known Nathan, our founder, for 12 years. And in the 12 years, he's always said he's going to write a book on meaning. And eventually last year, he wrote the book on meaning. 12 years later, sure. he delivered 10 pages and the book is, I'll send it to you. It's 10 pages. It's a hundred page book. He's delivered 10 pages and then the intention is for the other 90 pages, you write your own meaning. Nice. So it took him 12 years to write those 10 pages. It's That's beautiful. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, so again, knowledge and write books. Just, there's nothing like reading a book, man. I'm still old school. I can't read it on, a, on yeah. an iPad or something. No, no I've, I'm yet to try a Kindle, but yeah. Yeah, I've, also got, I've also got the book. I, yeah. I also read it. But I think what you're saying about how when you reread it, you get a different perspective. I, I think I need to go and reread yeah. that book. Also, I have to give a quick shout out to Portuguese Heritage. Shout out, Paulo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so second one, one word to describe the future of, I want to say branding, but I want to shift it to culture. One word to describe the future of culture. Sure. One word to um, one word to describe the future of culture. Um, one word to describe the future of culture. Braveness. Awesome. Braveness. Best city for inspiration. It says here in Africa. Yeah. But I don't want to limit it. Yeah. Because you did mention you did travel abroad yeah. to various Look, different I tell places. Look, actually in Africa. Um, I, just, I I think it's got to be Johannesburg. Like yeah. This 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 city's this city's dope. Right? Like, <laughs> I think if you can make it in Joburg, you can make it anywhere in the world. You know, including New York and Hong Kong and uh, you know Singapore. Joburg is it's gritty. It's the wild wild west. Where you got to look over your shoulder and you better know exactly what saloon is in front of you. You can either go to it or you can't. But it's 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 a proper hardcore city. Yeah. Uh, internationally, you know, like. Yo, um, the weirdly enough, I'd have to say it's London. Okay. You know, London has, um, it, it's a, if, if you go back in time around how London's been built, um, it, it, it's a, the curation of London today is just incredible, you know, and it's an it's a ever-evolving organism as well. I, I really think for a, for a, for a, for a very, very city, um, busy city it's it's incredibly inspiring you know you can say new york and you can say like singapore and dubai and they, they are incredibly inspiring cities but london has still got a it's got an aristocratic it's got an aristocratic way it's got an old way to it that's still very much part of its heritage and its its vibration today i i traveled to london not too recently or recently but one of the things that really hit me was you know south africa we built around our diversity yeah and i was surprised when i went to london because you go to london and there's people from 
everywhere around the world yeah. and it really opened up my yeah. eyes i was like just you know think all the restaurants you know mm. the the amount of restaurants and you know london's also not built around lifestyle it's built around socialization so it's a very big drinking culture and mm. eating culture and meeting you um out and all of that but it's 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 a great city it's got amazing energy about it if you weren't in the career that you're in today what would you be doing man i'd love to be a team principal for an f1 team okay I'd love to <laughs> dream job is a red bull head of red bull I, all right I, I tell you you, you know I, it's just just the, the, the steering wheel of an F1 car alone is over 3,000 components. Then you talk about precision on pit stops, like every split second counts. And, and I try and apply the same philosophies and organizational skills within our business. I, I, I see it. There's a, there's a presentation I did many years ago that good is not good enough. Um, and the, the analogy is an F1 team and overlay it against uh, our business in itself. But yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big F1. I'm not a petrol head. I just love the organization of an F1 team. Mm. It's incredible. It's incredible. Sure. Uncle Adam, thank you so much. Pleasure. It's thank you guys for having pleasure. me. It was just really cool. Awesome. Really cool. Thank you. So that's that. Episode 22. We'll see you on the flip side. Thank you so much for watching this latest episode of The Seacast. If you enjoyed it, please like, share, and subscribe. We're trying to achieve a huge mission and we need you to invest in it. The best way to do that is by liking, sharing, and subscribing and leaving a comment down below. By doing that, you help the algorithm understand that we are offering content that is valuable and it will reach more people. There might also be someone out there that just wants to learn a lesson or who might be able to take something away from the podcast. Share it with them. And lastly, if you would like to be more involved in the community, if you want access to opportunities, knowledge from our experience in the digital marketing space, or to connect with other people who are like-minded and uplifting the continent, the starting businesses, and using tech and creativity to make them successful, join the WhatsApp group by scanning the QR code, and we'll chat with you there. Until then, bye.